I'm back here. Uh, so, yes, today we are going to uh, talk about another uh, first order method. Uh, this is called the conditional gradient or uh, Frank Wolf method. And uh, on a personal note, I this is a topic that is uh, especially close to my heart. I, I've been working with uh, a couple of collaborators on, on this algorithm. I, I, I find this to be really, really intriguing and fascinating. Uh, so towards the end of the lecture, I'll, I'll, I'll sneak in a little piece of uh, work that I, uh, with some collaborators, have completed over the last year. Um, so just a quick uh, recap. Uh, this is what um, you guys were seeing over the last couple of lectures, so ADMM, and this was, this is a, a very clever uh, uh, family of algorithms to solve problems um, that can be written in that format, right? You have, you can, uh, if you can break down your uh, objective and uh, your constraints in that form, then you construct the augmented Lagrangian, and then the ADMMM method is based on uh, this combination of uh, dual updates and primal updates. And then you saw how uh, in, in, um, in scale form, you can also uh, see the ADMM if you just replace the variable um, U, if you make a change of variables, then this has some advantages in terms of your calculations. In particular, the W variable is easier to, uh, uh, to update. Uh, and then of course, there were many more uh, variations of that and that is what Ryan uh, discussed before. So today, uh, as I already indicated, the, the, the purpose of our uh, meeting today is to talk about the conditional gradient method. Uh, and uh, I want to describe the algorithm. It's actually an incredibly simple algorithm. You'll see that in, in just a few, uh, few minutes. It should ring a bell. It will be, it, it's a, in my opinion, it's a small variant on um, projected gradient, essentially. It's, it's an alternative to projected gradient. Then we'll talk about the convergence properties of um, conditional gradient, and some, uh, some other variants uh, of the algorithm. So uh, to set the stage, let's, uh, let's uh, dust off something that goes back to the first few weeks of the class, uh, of the course, and that is um, projected gradient descent. So if you think about uh, that problem up there, right? Minimize a convex objective function subject to some uh, convex set. So projected gradient descent is uh, essentially a particular case of uh, proximal gradient. Uh, the updates, the algorithm is based on this kind of update, right? So you, uh, to get the kth uh, iterate, you take the k minus one iterate, right? Take a step length in the negative direction of the gradient and then project onto the set C. Okay, so that is uh, projected gradient descent. And uh, again, as, as I just mentioned, this is a special case of uh, proximal gradient descent. And we can motivate it by thinking in terms of the uh, quadratic expansion of f around uh, xk minus 1. So uh, xk is the projection onto c of the minimizer of this quadratic approximation of f. Okay? If we didn't have c, then this is just the standard uh, gradient descent, right? If we didn't have C, this, this would be redundant. Uh, because we have C, we project onto C, and that's, that's the whole name of the game. So, uh, so that's, that is, again, uh, projected gradient, right? Actually, I didn't print that, but projected gradient. So now we are going to consider, again, the same problem, right? So the same problem. So we are still looking at uh, minimize f of x over x in c. But this time, we are, uh, rather than minimizing a quadratic, a quadratic approximation of uh, f, as the projected gradient does, okay, so rather than working with this local quadratic uh, expansion of, around, uh, of f around xk minus 1, instead of working with that, we are going to do something that in some ways is much simpler, and that is first we look at the uh, point in C that makes the most uh, negative product with the gradient. Okay. And then we just move towards that point. So let me draw a little picture here. Uh, 
it, this, I'm going to draw a two-dimensional picture, and then I'll show you in a moment a fancy three-dimensional picture that I didn't draw because I have a very hard time drawing that. Uh, but the two-dimensional picture is much easier to draw. So suppose that this is your set C, uh, and uh, I'm not going to draw anything fancy, just a triangle. Okay, so suppose that this is your set, suppose that this is, the, the, the triangle is C, and suppose that you're here, right? You're here, this is your X, and the gradient points, for example, uh, in this direction. Let's say it points, for instance, this way. Suppose that that is gradient F of X. So what the algorithm uh, does is, well, find the point in C that minimizes, uh, I guess in this case, yeah, the point that minimizes gradient of F times uh, that. So this guy here, this would be, this would be S arc mean of gradient F of X uh, S, right, over S in C. So this would be, if you want, my S star, okay? And the, the conditional gradient is that after I identify this point, then we move towards that point. So we will move around here. So if this is, say, xk, and this is xk, this would be sk. I guess S, um, this is sk minus 1, k minus 1. Then this guy here would be xk. We'll take some length towards that um, minimizer of the gradient, okay? Uh, so there is no projection. That is a key difference between uh, conditional gradient and projected gradient. So here, there is no projection. In some, in some sense, we have made a trade-off. We have traded projection for, we need to minimize that uh, linear function over C. Okay, so in some way, they, uh, implicitly here is the assumption that Frank Wolf or conditional gradient, we, we must be able to solve these kinds of problems. Uh, minimize, com compute the minimizer of any linear function over C. Okay? Uh, so that is conditional gradient. Okay? And uh, in principle, in principle, we could do a line search, right? So the gamma, we could do a line search between xk minus 1 and sk. We could do a line search. Uh, or we could just take some kind of uh, prescribed convex combination of those two points. So the default choice is to choose this kind of convex combination, move from the current point to the uh, minimizer by that much. Okay, so at the beginning, we take aggressive steps. And then as the algorithm progresses, it takes smaller steps towards the minimizer. As long as the gamma is between 0 and 1, we will remain feasible. Okay? So, uh, so that's, that's the algorithm, and that's what we, uh, we will be discussing over the next hour or so. Uh, maybe one point that it's uh, uh, nice to note is that, of course, the update up there right, is written in the way that we normally think about convex combinations, right? some weight on the initial point and some weight on the final point. But of course, that's the same thing as writing it as uh, take xk minus 1 and move a certain length in the difference between, uh, in, the, in the vector that points to sk minus 1 from xk minus 1. So move in the direction, in this direction. So that is, uh, that is conditional gradient. So, uh, and again, this is the two-dimensional picture that shows the, the kind of the logic of the algorithm. This is the algorithm. And then here is the fancy uh, three-dimensional picture that is, of course, not drawn by me. Um, it was drawn by this guy, Martin Jaggi. Uh, maybe a little historical remark real quick. So Frank and Wolf, they were postdocs who were working with uh, Tucker in uh, Princeton uh, back in the 50s. This is a very, very old algorithm in the 50s. Uh, and then they, as postdocs, they, uh, they proposed this algorithm for quadratic functions initially. And then it's one of those things that I, I think you've heard me say this several times here. The algorithm uh, you know, was published in some journal in 56. And maybe, maybe uh, Wolf later wrote a follow-up paper like in the 70s. And for about 30 or 40 years, maybe even 50 years, there were not that many papers on Frank Wolf. And then in the last uh, 
six to seven years or so, there has been this uh, explosion of interest in Frank Pulse. And that had to do a lot with uh, this guy, Martin Jaggi. He kind of revisited this algorithm and, and provided some nice insight that is a good part of what we are going to discuss next. Uh, so uh, in the picture here, the, the, the two-dimensional picture that I was trying to draw before is here at the bottom, right? Here is my current iterate x, and this is uh, the minimizer of the uh, gradient over uh, C, uh, in Jaggi's paper, D is the, 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 the set over which we are um, optimizing. Uh, and uh, we will move in this direction. We will describe what this G means a little bit later. Okay? But um, that, is, that is the picture that goes with the algorithm. So uh, let me talk about certain kinds of problems that are uh, particularly amenable to uh, Frank Wolf. These are the most popular problems that people apply Frank Wolf to. Uh, so frequently, uh, or a class that in some way is naturally amenable to Frank Wolf is when we want to optimize over uh, balls. Okay, so if we have, if the set C is a ball of a certain size, say of radius T, with some norm, it doesn't have to be the Euclidean norm, it could be uh, in principle any norm. So if you think about this step, okay, the step of choosing that S, that key step for choosing in what direction we're going to move, S. Uh, we want to um, solve that problem. We want to find that minimizer. If you flip signs, that is the same as uh, finding the maximizer of the gradient time S, right? Where S is over that ball, the unit ball. Uh, and if you think about that for a moment, that is simply the dual norm of the gradient. That is the dual norm of the gradient. The max will be the dual norm of the gradient. And whatever that is attained, that would be a sub-differential of that uh, dual norm. Okay? So here, this denotes the dual norm of the, the norm above. right? And uh, it, as long as we are able to compute sub-differentials of that norm, then we can compute this minimizer, and then we are in good shape. We are well set up to uh, do, to apply Frank Wolf. Okay. Uh, so now here is the here is a key advantage. In many cases, it could be a lot easier to do this computation. Right? To in particular, it could be a lot easier to compute a sub differential here, uh, a sub gradient here. That could be in many cases much easier than to compute a projection onto the uh, ball. And that is when uh, Frank Wolf could be a good alternative to, to doing um, uh, a projected gradient or, or proximal gradient. So uh, here is an example of that. This is uh, an example that also sort of uh, hints at something that we will discuss next week. So if you think about uh, this problem, uh, should not be completely unfamiliar, right? This is the L1 regulariz regularization problem, so related to Lasso. Uh, if we think about that problem in this form, if we impose, if we don't have a tuning parameter, but we uh, put a constraint on the, no on the one norm, in that case, uh, the dual norm is the infinity norm, right? The infinity norm. And if you think about that for a moment, right? If you think about that for a moment, uh, think about what is the the sub-differential of the infinity norm, that would be any of the unitary vectors that uh, catches the maximizer, the, the, the largest uh, absolute value entry of that norm. So the S in this case, the S will be a multiple of some unitary vector here, where that unitary vector nails the largest in absolute value entry of the uh, gradient. Okay, so. Here, uh, the index i k minus 1 will be the index with that absolute value is uh, largest. And then we would have to multiply by the uh, sign here to get the right uh, minimizer. Right. Uh, so if the sign of that is positive, we want to have negative sign and the other way around. And then we, uh, we take the step minus um, gamma k. The T there is because we are minimizing over not the unit, the, the, uh, 
L1 norm scaled by T. Okay. So if you think about what we are doing here, okay, this is again hinting at something that we will talk at more length about on Monday. Uh, this is sort of a special case of what are known as coordinate descent methods. Uh, if you think about what we are doing at each iteration here with xk, we are only updating one coordinate. What coordinate? The one that we identified in the step before. Okay, so uh, again, this is a one special case of a more general class of coordinate descent methods. All right. And again, uh, in, if you think about it, this just requires going over the entries of the gradient and finding the largest one. So that is simpler than projecting onto the L1 ball. All right. Okay, so that's the L1 regularization. And then there is something similar that happens if you have, say, LP, where P is uh, bigger than one, right? Uh, in that case, the uh, problem of finding, so this, again, the, the step here, this problem, right? That corresponds to, again, for norms, for norms corresponds to this problem. If the original norm is the one, is the P norm, then the dual norm is the Q norm, right? Where one of, where Q and P have this relationship, one over P plus one over Q is one. Uh, and in that case, then this, this requires a small little uh, calculation, but it's a straightforward calculation. Then you can actually see that the, uh, the, sub the sub gradient can be computed uh, this way, okay? Where, so we have to compute, it takes a, a little bit more work, but you can, essentially you apply what is called the uh, Holder's inequality, and then you see that the minimizer there is attained at this vector, where you have to scale this so that the uh, Q norm is uh, one, okay? The Q norm is one, okay? So this is not, uh, this is, this is a straightforward calculation, but it's not a triviality. Okay? I'm skipping a few steps here. Uh, now, again, this is much simpler than projecting on the LP ball, okay? on the LP ball. Uh, so the projections on the LP ball, right, if we were to think about the alternative of using projected gradient or uh, uh, proximal gradient, uh, the projections involving the LP term, uh, they, they don't have a straightforward uh, calculation in contrast to this. So that's, L, that's uh, the case when we have the P norm. If we have a fancier uh, space, right, a space of matrices, and we work with the trace norm, right, the trace, uh, then it turns out that uh, in that case, the dual norm is the operator norm. And uh, to find the, uh, to find that gradient, uh, sorry, to find, uh, yes, we, I, I am missing one small, uh, there is a typo in, uh, in the slides there, I'm missing a, so maybe I can put it here, I realize that, yes, I realize that there is uh, one small step missing here, so I just realized that now, there is a little typo here, this should actually be the sub-differential, right, the sub-differential here. We want this to be the sub-differential. It's just a special case of this more general case. So what is the sub-differential? So sorry about that, that's a typo there. To compute that sub-differential, again, this, this is not uh, uh, immediate, but it, it, it has a simple, uh, a simple verification that the, uh, the sub-differential is, the sub-differential at that vector is negative t times u v transpose where u and v are the leading left and right singular vectors of the gradient of f. Okay. So uh, again, this is a case when the, uh, the, the, the first step in the um, Frank Wolf method, right? The first step is easily doable and it's a lot, a lot simpler than projecting onto uh, that ball. Projecting onto that ball, in principle, 
in principle is doable, but it would require, a, in principle, a full singular value decomposition. Okay. Here, the key is that to find, the, uh, to find a subgradient, to find the minimizer, we just have to compute the leading uh, singular vectors. Okay. So, uh, so that's one more example. Uh, if you think about uh, Frank Wolf, right? So we have it right there. Uh, frequently, this is done in optimization. The, uh, the constraint problem, often we tackle it or we look at a, an alternative formulation of that in terms of combining the constraint and the objectives, this Lagrange form. So in principle, if we, if we want to solve the first problem, in principle, that is equivalent to the second problem for some, for some suitable tuning parameter lambda. So if we want to compare, say, algorithms for the first problem, we should be open to comparing them also to algorithms that apply to the second problem, for example, um, proximal gradient. So uh, here, is, here is what happens if we are looking at, say, the two problems. So let me put this slide back here. Uh, yes. Here's what happens if we uh, compare the two problems. So if we think about L1, that was, that was the first example that we discussed a few minutes ago, uh, to find the minimizer, right? So in the first step of Frank Wolf, you have to go through the uh, components of the gradient. If we were to apply, it, alternatively, proximal gradient to this guy, okay, proximal gradient, then proximal gradient requires a soft uh, thresholding. And both of them essentially require of the order of n flops. Uh, if you think about the LP norm, the LP norm, Frank Wolf uh, has to compute, has to go over, the, again, the, the components of the gradient and do some calculation that we described earlier. So that's, again, linear uh, number of flops. The proximal operator, on the other hand, if this is, the, if this is a p-norm that is different from 1, 2, or infinity, then it's not necessarily computable directly. If you think about the trace norm, again, the trace norm is the one that essentially we just saw. We just have to compute the top left and right singular values. Uh, if you were to look at the proximal operator, then you will require the entire singular value. Okay. Now, there are other examples of uh, uh, either you know, some regularizers for problems or other examples where you have constraints that are also amenable to Frank Wolf. So let me give you one example that is one of my favorite examples, again, because this relates to uh, some work that I have previously done. So uh, the following problem, so th this is this is a problem that is rarely uh, amenable to uh, Frank Wolf if we are minimizing over the convex hull of a set of atoms. So if A is a set of atoms in Rn, such that uh, for any G, this guy, arg mean, G A is computable. Okay, so if if this is computable, then automatically you can apply uh, Frank Wolf to that problem. So an example where that uh, is computable is if the set A, for example, is finite. If you are optimizing over a polytope, then solving this problem simply means to go over the points that span the po uh, that generate the polytope. Okay. Uh, if you are optimizing over some kind of, uh, uh, well, there are other sets of atoms for which also this, this map is um, computable. Okay. Uh, so, so here is a comparison of a straightforward uh, implementation. This is actually a picture that uh, Ryan generated. Uh, a straightforward implementation of Frank Wolf or conditional gradient uh, compared to Lasso. 
uh, if we apply projected gradient to the constrained lasso problem or conditional gradient. Okay? And uh, the general speed of convergence is roughly of the same order, but at least empirically, for this, experimentally for this example, there is some gap in between, Frank will, in, in between the conditional gradient and projected gradient. So uh, it appears that in practice, uh, conditional gradient is a little bit slower. I believe that uh, you know, once we are done with our projects with my collaborators, maybe that will be the comeback of Frank Wolf and you know, the picture here will flip. I'm confident of that. And you'll see at the end what I'm talking about. Okay. So it, it appears that at least uh, it, you know, with some, some um, straightforward uh, implementation, there is a, a little bit slower s speed for conditional gradient. Um, all right. So let me go back to the picture that I showed earlier. So let me, so I'm on slide 15. So let me put this here. Uh, talk about duality gap. Okay. So let me flash this very good looking picture that I showed earlier. So here is a very nice good looking picture. So the duality gap is actually uh, is this quantity here. So let me give you a very hand wavy description of what that uh, quantity is going to be. That quantity, this is very hand wavy, very informal, is going to be the difference between s and x, right? x, x minus s, that difference, multiplied by the relevant slope. What is the slope there? The slope is the gradient at x, right? Uh, and that's what you have here. You look at the gradient multiplied by x minus s. So if you think about this for a moment, and uh, use a geometric argument. That's exactly what this gap here represents. And what's so special about that? Uh, it turns out that that gives us an upper bound on the uh, optimality gap. Okay. So this is key. This is called g. So maybe I should have put that here. This is g at x k minus 1. is that quantity. That is an upper bound on the gap. Okay? So that gives us, that is very nice because then it's, 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 it's an estimate of how close to optimality we are throughout the algorithm. And another thing that is very nice about this is that the max here, you observe that S is flipped, uh, has the sign here flipped. So the, so the max here, the S that attains this max is exactly the one that is computed by the algorithm. So computing this G, essentially is uh, you know, free of charge. You don't have to do any extra calculation or any extra work to get that G once you're applying the um, conditional gradient algorithm. Okay. Uh, so now, to see that indeed this is an upper bound, here is how we can proceed. Let me put the picture here uh, again, uh, the slide here. In case I want to, uh, yeah, so if you think about, so here's why that is indeed a bound. Uh, so, yes, so we have, because f is a convex function, right? We have this inequality. So because f is convex, uh, f of s is above the linear approximation to f at x k minus 1. So we have this inequality. And now if we minimize both sides, okay, if we, if we minimize both sides over C, on the left, we get the mean of F over C, so that's our F star. And on the right, this part does not depend on S. This part is the mean over S in C. So if you then move around F star to the other side and uh, that guy to this side, and flip signs, right? Then you get, on the left, you get the bound, uh, you get exactly the, what we called G. Okay. So uh, this suboptimality gap is, um, you know, it's just a consequence of duality and taking that uh, minimization there. All right, so that's nice. Uh, now, another way of thinking about this is uh, 
we could think about the original problem as uh, we can try to actually relate it to um, genuine duality. So if we think about the original problem as f of x plus the indicator function of c at x, then the dual problem, the Fenkel dual problem, is negative uh, conjugate of f at u minus uh, the conjugate of the indicator function. Does anyone recall what the conjugate of the indicator function is? So the conjugate of the indicator function is the support function. Okay, so this guy here is the support function. Let me just put that here, because uh, that's going to come up there. So recall, the indicator function, right, is plus infinity if x is not in c and 0 otherwise. So then the conjugate, right, at s, this is, by definition, right, by definition, this is the max over x of sx minus ic of x, right? So if you think about that for a moment, ic can only take those two values. This is the same as max over x in c of sx, okay? Because this max is trivially minus infinity when you, are, when you take x outside c. And this is what we have called the support function. The support function of C at S. At S. So the, the dual problem is this sum of the support function of minus U and uh, F star of U, right? So if you, uh, if you look at the duality gap, Right. If you look at the duality gap, you take x in C and look at the duality gap. The duality gap is this quantity on the left. If you use uh, the Fenkel inequality, the sum of f and f star at x and u respectively is greater than or equal to x transpose u. So then we get that the, the gap between the primal and dual problems at x and u respectively is bounded below by this quantity here. Now, if we evaluate this guy at this value, at the gradient, then we get that kind of uh, duality gap between the primal problem evaluated at xk minus 1 and the dual evaluated at the gradient. So the g that we had before the g that we had before, which is what is written at the very beginning, the g is gradient times x minus s, turns out to be simply what you get here when you, um, uh, when you plug in, again, xk minus 1 and um, gradient. All right. So that is the uh, duality gap. Okay. Uh, let me flash this picture one more time because now comes the really... Maybe the, the most interesting part, and that is the convergence property of Frank Wolf. So let me put this picture here for a moment. Uh, let me pause here for just a second in case there is a question or a comment or anything like that. Uh, let's see. Yes. Are we all good? Questions or comments? Anything? Yeah, so that's exactly what we're going to do next. And uh, the reason that I'm pausing here for a moment is that the, the key to get the duality, the convergence guarantee is this duality gap. But this and one more piece of, uh, one more piece. Okay? But this is a key ingredient. You can see why this would be a key ingredient because this allows us to monitor how close we are to optimality. Okay, so this is going to play a key role. Okay? All right, so let me, let me go ahead and show you then the uh, convergence uh, properties. So to that end, we need one more little piece of notation here, and that is, so here's G, right? This is our duality gap, this is G. And in addition to G, we're going to rely on uh, something, and this, is, uh, this was a really nice insight that this guy had, Martin Jaggi. He defined uh, something called the curvature constant of F over C, 
okay, curvature constant as that quantity you see there. So what is that quantity measuring? So if you think about what's, ha what's happening to the uh, expression on the right, okay, let me maybe make a little observation here. So, so if you take x and y in C, and you look at uh, what I, what is on the, that right-hand side expression, so without the other uh, stuff, just f of x minus, f of y minus f of x minus gradient f, x, y minus x. What is the sign of this thing? So the sign of this, f is a convex function, right? So this has to be non-negative. So the, uh, the curvature co constant is in some way how far the function is from the linear approximation. So in particular, if you were to start with a linear function, if you started with a linear function, if f was, was linear, this would be 0. Right? The, more curve, the more curved f is, the bigger this difference is. Uh, but in some way, you need to somehow uh, account for the, uh, how far apart x and y are. So that's why uh, you define the curvature constant over the entire set this way. You take all the possible combi convex combinations of two points there, namely x and s. Right? Uh, y is any kind of convex combination of, of x and s, defined by that gamma. So gamma there is between 0 and 1. And then you take 2 divided by gamma squared times that difference. So again, the intuition here is that the flatter the function is, the flatter, the closer to linear, then the smaller uh, that curvature constant would be. Okay. So before we even go to the proof in, and, and everything, uh, let me ask you a little pop quiz question here real quick. Look at the conditional gradient algorithm one more time. Let me ask you a very quick question. What would happen if the objective function, if the objective function were linear? If I had, if I had a linear objective function? The first iterate gets me to the minimum immediately, right? Because if the function is linear, then immediately the first s gets me right to the, uh, to the um, optimal solution. And the size would be for, the, for k equal to, uh, I guess for k equal to 1, the size would be 1. I take exactly the step to that point. So if the function were linear, I would converge in one step. So the closer the function is to linear, the better the algorithm should behave. Uh, so that is reflected exactly in the way that we, um, in the bound that we get here. It turns out that uh, the conditional gradient with uh, the step sizes defined by this, gamma k 2 over k plus 1, satisfies this uh, inequality. Okay. F, uh, the kth iterate minus f star is less than or equal to 2m over k plus 2. So again, if m were 0, we would converge in one step. Uh, so if you think about it, right, if you go back and dust off the kinds of bounds that you had for, uh, I guess, gradient descent and for uh, proximal gradient, it's, the same, it's of the same um, order. It's 1 over epsilon. So if you want to get within, within tolerance epsilon, this takes you um, one, all of 1 over epsilon steps. All right. So that is the key property of um, uh, the key property of the uh, conditional gradient algorithm. So let me let's go over the proof of this. The proof is remarkably uh, simple. Uh, in my opinion, it's one of those proofs that is uh, ideally suited for uh, classroom discussion because it is a really very, very nice and simple proof. So let me keep the statement here, and let me tell you what the key step in the proof is. So the key step in the proof, oh, I guess, let me, let me skip this uh, slide for a moment, and let me fl flip these two things first. So let me go over the proof first, OK, since I already kind of got started on that way. So I want to prove this thing. It turns out that 
the, this theorem will follow immediately from that key inequality. Okay. Uh, so let me first, uh, this is how I usually like to discuss these kinds of proofs. Let me first show you why the theorem follows from that inequality, because in some way that I think is, um, it motivates what seems otherwise just a, com a somewhat artificial inequality there. So let me show you how this theorem follows. So So we proceed by induction. So we prove we proceed by induction. So uh, I guess uh, when k is equal to, I'm going to let you see. I didn't think about the zero step, but. So I'm going to skip the, the zero step and assume, assume that the inequality holds for k minus 1. So assume that f k minus 1 minus f star is less than or equal to 2m. If I, if I, use, if I look at the statement of the theorem at k minus 1, this would be k plus 1, OK, at k plus 1. Uh, then. And suppose that we have the key inequality, the basic inequality. Okay, so we will we'll apply the basic inequality to uh, x. So the basic inequality is there, right? Uh, maybe I should just put it here. We get that f x k is less than or equal to f x k minus 1 minus gamma g x k minus 1 and uh, gamma k and gamma k square over 2 times m. Okay, now g x k minus 1, what do we know about g? What was the whole fuss about g? What does g get me? G is that is, is named a duality gap, but it's really a suboptimality gap. G is an upper bound on the uh, suboptimality gap. So this guy is greater than or equal to f x k minus one minus f star, right? And gamma k by uh, definition, right? Gamma k is uh, two over k plus one. Right? So this is two over k plus one. So we get that f x k, right? This guy here is less than or equal to f x uh, k minus one, and then we have gamma times g, but g is an upper bound on this. So the second term here we can bound by gamma two over k plus one times this guy f x k minus 1 minus f star, right? And then we have the third term, and that is, uh, again, gamma. So that's 4 over k plus 1 square divided by 2 and m. So we have a 2 here and an m, all right? And then this basically finishes it, because if we think about now the gap, right, x k minus f star, I will sub subtract f star, so then I can factor the gap at the k minus 1 iterate. So we get uh, the following, 1 minus 2 over k plus 1, right? And then f as x k minus 1 minus f star, right? And then we get 2 m over k plus 1 squared. Okay, and in somewhere we need to use induction, right? So that's here is where we are going to use it. So here, this guy here is k, uh, I guess k plus one minus two, right? So that's k minus one over k plus one, right? Times uh, this guy here, which is two m 
over k plus 1, right? And then 2m over k plus 1 squared. So uh, if you now factor, let me do it here, 2 over, I guess, 2m. Then I get uh, k right, over k plus 1 squared. Right? And this term is, uh, this is easy to see, this is less than or equal to 1 over k plus 2. Okay? So then we get that everything is less than or equal to 2m over k plus 2. Okay? So that's the, uh, that is the proof of the theorem. Right? Modulo having the basic inequality. And the proof of the basic inequality is very straightforward. Uh, if we want to prove the basic inequality, that almost follows for free from the definition of uh, the duality gap. Plus, a little thing about, uh, of course, somewhere we also need to use the definition of the curvature, right? So if you think about uh, fx plus, right? This is f of x plus the step in the direction s minus k, right? If we use the definition of the curvature, right? The definition of the curvature, which is here, then this quantity can be bounded above by a linear approximation around x plus the term corresponding to the uh, curvature. Okay, that's how we define the curvature. So, but what we get here in the middle is exactly gamma times um, g of x. Okay. Uh, so again, the inequality there is, is simply the definition of the uh, curvature. Okay. Uh, so that is the uh, that is the proof of convergence of uh, conditional gradient. Okay. Um, one, I want to make a couple of comments about the uh, this guy M. Okay, because some of you may be thinking, well, but this is like cheating a little bit, right? You are showing that the uh, speed of convergence of conjugate gradient is roughly 1 over k, you know, module, some constant times 1 over k. Uh, but you need to, th that is the, the, um, stated in terms of that uh, new constant, namely the curvature. If you think back about the kind of uh, convergence uh, statement that you had for, say, uh, gradient descent, it, de it, it was depending on the Lipschitz constant of your, um, of your gradient. So is there any way that this could be compared to that? And the answer is yes, they can be compared. Uh, it turns out that uh, the, the curvature, if we have, uh, if the objective function has Lipschitz gradient, the curvature can be bounded in terms of the Lipschitz gradient and the diameter of the set C. So uh, the, the curvature M, which is defined here, okay, this is M, that can be bounded as L, where L is the uh, Lipschitz constant of the gradient, times the diameter of the set C squared. And what is the diameter? The diameter is what you would imagine it to be, is the, the, the the, the two points, the distance between the two points, the norm of the two points that are farthest apart in C. Okay. Why does that follow? It, it, it is a very straightforward calculation. If you, uh, if you look at the definition here of the curvature, right? the definition of the curvature, uh, and then recall that when F is Lipschitz, you have this inequality. Okay. Then you can plug that inequality here Okay, this difference here would be less than or equal to L over 2, norm of y minus x squared. All right? And then uh, the gamma essentially cancels here, and you get that is, uh, the m is less than or equal to the max of L times the norm of x minus s squared. So if you take x and s the farthest possible apart, uh, that will give you a bound on m. Okay? Uh, so that's... That is, uh, in some way, the kinds of assumptions that we made for a proximal gradient are comparable to, to assuming that we have a bounded curvature. 
is a, is, is a simi is a, is the same kind of assumption. Uh, all right. So let's see. Uh, let me. I think that the next point that I want to mention about uh, con uh, con conditional gradient or Frank Wolf is one of it's one of those key key ideas that I would like to make sure that everyone walks out of here remembering. So that is going to be very important. So I want to make sure, I want to do everything I can to make sure that I have your full undivided attention. So if I were to pick a point in today's class for a break, this would be the optimal point so that I have you fresh and ready to absorb that important key property about Frank Wolf that I'll tell you right after the break in five minutes. Okay. I only noticed right here on the spot, I, uh, we went over this proof, right, by induction. Uh, maybe you see it immediately. I, uh, it's not obvious to me, but it's, I know it's true that, of course, this has, for the induction to work, this has to hold at the initial point. So uh, it should be easy to see that fx0 minus f star um, is bounded above by m, right? And I think that's easy from the optimality conditions, probably, for uh, f. Uh, star. So I think if you use the definition of M and you pick uh, probably X as the, um, as the minimizer, then that should, give you, um, that should give you the statement for K equal to zero. Okay? So uh, I, didn't, I have to admit that I, I overlooked that before. All right, but modulo that detail, uh, this is the proof of the convergence analysis. So um, the key property about uh, conditional gradient that I wanted to highlight is, and I cannot highlight this enough, uh, is affine invariance. Okay, this is a very, very special property of uh, conditional gradient, and it's somewhat remarkable because let me, let me recall something that uh, we have discussed in class, and you have actually uh, worked on in the homework, so this should be familiar. Uh, so recall gradient descent, right? Gradient descent is based on this, right? X plus is X minus T gradient F of X, right? Uh, Newton's method. is uh, x plus equal to x minus, we can put a t here or no t, let me put it in pure form, f of x inverse gradient f of x, right? Now, we uh, made a fuss about this uh, back a, a few weeks ago. Gradient descent is not a fine invariant, right? Gradient descent is not scale invariant. In particular, in particular, if you, uh, if you take a quadratic function f, right, and you scale some of the coordinates appropriately, a gradient descent may uh, start behaving much better because the, the level curves may be, uh, may be transformed into circles, into, um, yeah, balls, circles. By contrast, Newton's method is affine invariant, okay, meaning that the iterates are essentially the same regardless, the algorithm behaves the same regardless of how you change uh, uh, the variables in any kind of uh, affine way. Uh, so, so now, Frank Wolf, conditional gradient, is kind of in the same spirit as gradient descent, right? So at first, at first sight, maybe your impulse would be to uh, conclude that like gradient descent, that is, sent, that is uh, susceptible if you want to affine invariance, that is dependent on affine invariance, that the same thing should happen to conditional gradient. Uh, but the remarkable fact is that it isn't, okay? Uh, so conditional gradient is affine invariant, and that is a really, really cool property, because it means, so just for the record here, recall that we have those two, and gradient descent, gradient descent, is not a fine invariant, okay? Newton's method is a fine invariant. 
is a finding there. All right, so now, what does this mean exactly? Uh, well, if we change coordinates, right? If we, if we scale our coordinates and then we scale the function accordingly, uh, then everything essentially works the same way. So why does that happen? Uh, again, your, in, your initial intuition, and this was my initial intuition when I was first learning this, was that the same way that gradient descent is, is, uh, is dependent on affine transformation, may, 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 is not affine invariant, the same thing would happen to a conditional gradient. But the reason that it doesn't happen is that if you think about what happens to, the, to H there, for example, right? if we change X to A X prime, and then we define H of X prime as F of A of X prime, right? then the gradient of H, the gradient of H is the gradient of F pre-multiplied by uh, A. Okay? Uh, now, the interesting thing is that if we are optimizing over C, and we transform, then the transform problem we would optimize over A inverse C. So somehow the, the, the transformation in the variables cancels, the transformation in, the, in your variables affects the gradient and that cancels with the uh, constraint set that you are optimizing over. So uh, the beauty of that is, for instance, the S then remains the same, uh, or it's not the same, but it just, gets transformed the same way. The, the optimal S at each step is the transformed S that you apply, that you get if you apply the algorithm to uh, the original problem. Uh, and the, here's another remarkable fact. If you look at the uh, curvature constant, the curvature constant also uh, is identical. The curvature constant does not depend on how uh, the variables are, if the variables are transformed via some affine transformation. Okay, so just to be sure here, since I, I'm, I'm making a fuss about this, uh, what, what, what this is looking at is, so this is the affine of conditional gradient. This problem, minimize f of x, x in c, this is completely equivalent to the problem minimize h of x prime, right? x prime in A inverse C, where uh, h of x prime is f of A x prime. Okay? So when we say affine invariance, that means at each step here, the iterates correspond to the iterates here okay, via that A uh, transformation. Uh, and again, if you look at the definition of the curvature constant for H over the set A inverse C, that is exactly the same as the curvature constant of F over the set C. So the bound that we were just discussing before the break about the convergence is, is ex exactly the same uh, in one case or the other. And in fact, that has to happen because the entire algorithm essentially is invariant, the entire algorithm. So it would be very odd if the analysis somehow were not uh, affine invariant. All right, uh, so let me maybe go back for a moment to something that I mentioned again before the break. This is something that is a little bit puzzling and people are still, people meaning you know, at, least, at least me and my collaborators, uh, something that is a little bit puzzling. We are trying to completely understand I'm a little bit confused about this. Uh, that bound on the right, diameter of C times L, that bound on the right is not affine invariant. M is affine invariant, but the bound on the right is not. Uh, so that's a little bit weird, right? Uh, so, you know, something to ponder over. I, I don't, I'm still trying to find the answer to that, uh, how exactly we, we, we make sense of that, okay? Because the diameter of C clearly is, it depends on how we change our, um, our variables. L also depends on how we change our variables. So uh, anyway, 
Okay, so that is uh, affine invariance. Okay. Um, one little uh, variant on uh, uh, the analysis of uh, the analysis of um, con uh, of uh, conditional gradient is if we don't exactly solve the uh, minimization problem at each step. So if we go back to the very, very beginning of the definition of uh, conditional gradient algorithm, right? If we don't solve this problem exactly, but we only solve it approximately, okay? For instance, if the SK minus is not exactly the minimizer, but it's, it's close to the minimizer, it's an approximate, uh, an approximate minimizer, meaning it minimizes within that delta uh, inaccuracy parameter. Then the proof that we just went through, the same proof applies. You just have to adjust for delta. And at the end of the day, you get this kind of a statement here. Okay? Uh, so that's, that's neat. Uh, but of course, if you think about this tolerance here, the, the error here as being an additive error, the additive error also has to go to zero, right? Because the gamma k goes to zero. Um, but that's, that's a, a really nice uh, extension of the, of the previous analysis. Essentially what this says is if the error is small enough, then uh, the same convergence bound of Frank Wolf applies. Uh, so let me tell you about a few variants of uh, Frank Wolf. So uh, line search here, uh, at the very beginning of class today, I mentioned that the, uh, the default Frank Wolf is to take gamma k equal to, over, to 2 over k plus 1. But you could do something a little bit more, uh, more sophisticated. For example, in certain cases, in certain cases, you could do a line search between x k minus 1 and s k minus 1. You could, for, exa for example, if the function that you are optimizing is a quadratic function, if it is a quadratic function, then uh, this is a one-dimensional quadratic function that you can easily uh, minimize. So that's, that's a variant, and in principle, this would allow you, this would open the door for faster uh, convergence. You could also not just optimize over the line that joins xk minus 1 and sk minus 1, but you could optimize over the points that we have collected so far. Uh, but of course, that one is much more expensive, okay, much more expensive. Uh, so here's one that I really like a lot. Uh, this is called uh, Frank Wolf with away steps. And let me motivate this with the picture that I drew at the beginning of class today. Uh, well, actually, a similar picture. So here is the motivation for Frank Wolf with away steps. Suppose that I have... Uh, Three points here. Suppose that this point is minus one zero, this point is one zero, and this point is uh, zero one. Okay, so that's my my set C, and I want to minimize, say, this very simple function x square subject to x in that convex hull. So again, one zero. 1, 0, and 0, 1. And I start right here. So here's what would happen to uh, Frank Wolf, to conjugate gradient. This is the, this obviously the minimizer is here, right? This would be x star. You would go to one of these two steps, to one of the two uh, vertices, so you will move here. Then you would go towards this guy. Suppose that you do exact line search, so you would go like this. Then you would go like this. Then you keep going like that. And essentially, the algorithm jams. The reason that the algorithm jams is that you have weight on this, on this vector here that you would like to get rid of. So the away steps are a little tweak on Frank Wolf that allows you to move not just towards a new point, but away from a point. So, uh, it, it, you, you need a little bit more notation. You need to assume that C is the convex hull of a set of atoms. For example, here, C would be the convex hull of these three atoms. And then you keep track of the iterates as convex combinations of your atoms. So let's say every x 
at every point is a convex combination of atoms that I'm going to call lambda a x times a. And then the conditional gradient with away steps does the following. This is the regular thing that we do. This is the regular step. We also compute a potential away step. How do we compute the away step? We solve, instead of solving the minimizer, we solve for the maximizer. Maximizer, but we only solve that over the atoms that we are currently using in X. So we look at the maximizer. And then we move either toward the minimizer or away from the maximizer. So we have two alternatives. The cost of both of these is very similar to the cost of the regular uh, Frank Wolf. So we choose either to move, this would be a regular step, this would be an away step. And here is what is really cool. We have linear convergence. So let me recall uh, one fact that uh, you, you actually saw something a little bit stronger than this. But gradient descent for strongly convex functions has linear convergence. Gradient descent has this, enjoys this speed of convergence, this linear convergence. It turns out that conditional gradient with away steps also has linear convergence. And the, 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 the uh, rate of convergence resembles, so this is the linear convergence rate for gradient descent. It turns out that for conditional gradient, we have a very similar rate of convergence that is linear, except that this guy here now has to take the form of this thing that is like a condition number of the function times it's a condition number of the function times a condition number of the atoms. The condition number of the atoms is uh, this good looking expression. The condition number of the atoms is something that we coined the name um, uh, facial distance. So uh, this applies to the case when A is finite. Okay, so I should have said that somewhere. So yeah, A is the set of atoms is finite. So this is a polytope. So if it is a polytope that is kind of with nice aspect ratio, then this uh, quantity here would be large. If it is a polytope that is uh, very skinny, that is nearly flat, that will be bad. Okay? Uh, but what is really remarkable is how the linear convergence of uh, gradient descent kind of extends very nicely, not to Frank Wolf, not to conditional gradient, but to conditional gradient with away steps. So the away steps uh, fix that. Uh, so that's, uh, this relates to, uh, as I said at the beginning of class, some work that I have been uh, thinking about for now a little over a year, uh, and something that I'm very, very, very excited about. Um, so in particular, if you go back to the picture that I flashed from Ryan, right, the, the comparison between conditional gradient and uh, proximal gradient, and conditional gradient was losing to, uh, to proximal gradient. I don't think that's the end of the story. I think that if we allow conditional gradient to have a little tweak, uh, you know, something more interesting could happen. All right, so that's uh, linear convergence. Let me also uh, uh, mention something that has to do with some work that Ryan did uh, a couple of years ago, and is uh, path following. So if you think about uh, this, this whole family of problems. So suppose that you want to solve uh, the whole path of minimization problems, minimize f of x subject to norm of x less than or equal to t. And you look at x, for example, the one norm. So this would be like the whole path for the lasso problem, for example. So here is a really nice idea. Uh, it turns out that you can rely on the Frank Wolf or, or the conditional gradient algorithm to generate an approximate uh, path of solutions. And the idea is very simple, uh, very clever. So you start with a t0, and at that point, uh, the initial, uh, compute the initial uh, optimal. Since t is 0, the feasible set is just 0. So that is a trivial problem. Uh, and then you fix two parameters, epsilon and m. And then you iterate this way. You, you update t. You increase t by this much. And then, then uh, between the previous t and the new tk, you leave x hat constant. Okay? 
And then to compute the new uh, x hat of tk, you apply Frank Wolf, you apply Frank Wolf until the duality gap is sufficiently small, meaning epsilon over m. Then you keep updating tk and running Frank Wolf. And if you keep doing that, then uh, because of the way that this is set up, so let me keep this guy here, because of the way that uh, this is set up, at the end of the day, the path that you get guarantees that is within epsilon of the optimal path. Okay? And the reason for that is uh, that the, the gap, what we have looked at as the duality gap, has that linear property. And that ensures that if I have made the duality gap small enough at, say, tk minus 1, then I can move it, I can increase tk minus 1 to tk and still maintain the duality gap less than epsilon. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a nice way of using Frank Wolf to essentially approximate the entire path of solutions uh, to this problem, and in a way that is very inexpensive, right? Like each iterate of Frank Wolf is very, um, very cheap. So uh, let me conclude with uh, so there are many references. Uh, like I said, you know, Frank Wolf was this is a. Uh, this, is, this was the first paper of Frank, uh, related to Frank Wolf, right? 56, long before I think everyone in this room was born, right? Uh, and uh, there's a lot of, if you look at all the other references, that they are, the earliest one is from 2010. Uh, so that first reference is very, it's a very popular paper that uh, talks about the Frank Wolf algorithm in relationship to, and its relationship with a number of problems in um, computational geometry. Uh, Ryan's paper is here at the end. Uh, this is a working paper that we are currently revising. And then the papers of Jaggi really have uh, really were a major boost to this, um, to this topic. Uh, so with that, I am doing something that I practically never do. I actually have like two minutes of uh, spare uh, to spare. So don't tell anyone, but I'm going to then end a little bit early today, which is unprecedented of me. So. Uh, Thank you very much. So I'll see you on Monday.